In this video, we're gonna break down the basics to taking photos in manual mode. So if you've been feeling daunted by it, this video is for you. So if you're just getting started as a photographer or just have yet to dabble in the manual mode arena, we're gonna break it down in a hopefully easy to understand way. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So let's start out by switching the camera to manual mode. Just about every DSLR or mirrorless camera will have something like this knob on top of the camera that allows you to change modes. You wanna make sure it's in the manual mode, which is usually the M. So what does manual mode actually mean for you, the photographer? It essentially means you'll have to make the appropriate adjustments to your ISO, shutter, and aperture to the correct settings to take the photo that you wanna take. All three of these elements determine your overall exposure. You may have heard of the exposure triangle, and that's what this is all about. So let's start with ISO or ISO. The ISO sets the sensitivity level of your camera's sensor. So the higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the sensor will be to light and the brighter your image will be. Now, conversely, the lower the ISO number, the less sensitive the sensor will be to light and the darker your image will be. When you're outside on a sunny day, generally an ISO of 100 should be fine or whatever the lowest ISO your camera allows. Now, once the sun starts to get lower in the sky or you move indoors, you'll likely need to increase the ISO to expose properly. The downside to this is higher ISO levels can introduce undesirable noise into the image. Some cameras are better at handling high ISO situations than others. So if you're on a more entry level camera, you may find that like an ISO of 1600, for example, is about the limit on how far you want to push your camera until it starts getting undesirably noisy. On higher end cameras like the Canon 1DX2, we've actually had usable photos shot at an ISO of 12,800. So this is where you wanna know your camera's limitations so you can do your best to get good looking shots. Now let's move on to shutter speed. Shutter speed is exactly what it sounds like and it determines how long your shutter is open, exposing the sensor to light. The shutter speed is generally displayed as a fraction of a second, like one over 250, meaning the shutter is open for about a 250th of a second. So if you need to increase the exposure of your image, you can do that by using a slower shutter. Let's say your image is dark and your ISO is already at 1600 and you don't want to introduce any more noise to the photo by increasing your ISO. Well, instead, you can use a slower shutter, like 1 1 25th of a second to let more light into your frame. With the shutter speed, you don't want it to be too slow because any movement to your camera or to the subjects in your scene can cause the photo to turn blurry. If you're shooting stationary subjects handheld, we recommend a shutter speed minimum of 1 1 25th of a second, but it's also a good idea to double check your photo after taking it to make sure it's sharp. You may find that you need to increase your shutter speed if the results are looking a little blurry, unless blurriness is your intention. Now let's talk about aperture. Aperture is determined by the lens you are shooting with, and most lenses that come with the kit, for instance, have a maximum aperture of f4.0 or so. But the smaller the number, the wider the aperture can open, letting in more light. So not only are you adjusting how much light comes through, you're also adjusting the depth of field. The depth of field basically determines how much of your image is reasonably sharp. So a greater depth of field means more of your image will be sharp. A more shallow depth of field means less of your image will be sharp. So if you want to get some creamy bokeh in your shot like this, you want a wide aperture, which means a small f-stop number. So for instance, here is the 50 millimeter f1.2 lens. If we set our aperture to f1.2, we're gonna let in a lot of light and have a very shallow depth of field where just about everything in front of and behind our focal point will be blurry. Now, there are other factors to depth of field like focal length and distance, but we won't get into that here. Just know that opening up your aperture to a smaller number will increase your exposure and help pop your subject out from its surroundings by creating a more shallow depth of field. The most obvious factor that affects your exposure is the light in your scene. If you're familiar with art photography, 99% of it is shot using available light, meaning no strobes, speed lights, or anything like that. Usually just whatever light the sun provides. The more you shoot in manual mode, the more you'll start to get a feel for what settings need to be adjusted, and it'll become second nature to you. Adding lights into your scene will affect your settings, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Uh, we did make a video on getting started with studio lighting, and we'll put a link to that one in the description. The meter will tell you whether your image is under or overexposed or exposed properly. Generally, you want the meter to be right in the center, displaying a properly exposed image. But if you like to shoot moodier or you like to shoot brighter and airier, you can adjust that as you'd like. Most DSLR and mirrorless cameras have pretty similar metering modes. On this camera, we have the choice of evaluative, partial, spot, and center weighted. We usually have ours set to evaluative metering. It can be applied to a wide variety of shooting scenarios and in general just works really well. 
This type of metering will look at different zones all across your frame to determine the appropriate exposure. Now, since we are in manual mode, the meter just shows you where your exposure is for your shot. It's not gonna adjust any of the settings for you. So it's up to you to look at the meter and then make any necessary adjustments. So here it's showing the image is underexposed. I can adjust the ISO, aperture, or shutter speed to bring the exposure up. In this case, the shutter speed is unnecessarily fast, so I will slow the shutter down to properly expose. Okay, so hopefully now you understand the pros and cons of adjusting each of these three settings. The best way to really learn is by taking the time with your camera to experiment with different settings so you can see for yourself the impact that adjusting each one has on your final image. I would say when I first started shooting, it took me about one month of shooting every day uh, to really get into the habit of um, working with manual mode. And uh, once it clicked, it's been like, it's like riding a bike, you know, it sort of just becomes muscle memory for you. So now let's go through a few different scenarios. With shutter speed, our go-to is usually around 1 to 50th of a second. If there's gonna be a lot of movement in our shot, then we'll definitely increase the shutter speed to make sure we get a nice sharp photo. But 1 to 50th of a second is a good place to start for many situations. Okay, with aperture, we usually say in the f2.0 to the 5.0 range, depending on the subject matter and the vibe that we want. If we're photographing a person, we know that f1.2 or 1.4 is going to be so shallow that we have to absolutely nail our focus. If we miss our focus at all, we could end up with our subject's nose in focus and not their eyes, which is why we don't normally shoot that shallowly. Sometimes if we have subjects at different distances from the lens and we want them all to be relatively sharp, we'll go up to somewhere between 5.6 and 10. But that also means we'll probably have to increase our ISO since we are losing light by making the aperture smaller. So let's take a few shots of our scene here. I have a 35 millimeter lens on my camera body, which is a Canon EOS R. If I want the wooden figure in focus and this hand, I'll try a shot at f8.0 with the wooden figure as my focal point. Okay, we can see that an aperture of 8.0 did a pretty good job of keeping those two subjects reasonably sharp, even though they're at two different distances from the camera lens. Now let's change the aperture to f1.4 and take another shot focused on our wooden figure. As you can see, both the foreground and the background are super blurry and out of focus, leaving our wooden figure sharp. But we can see some parts of our wooden guy here are actually pretty soft. So if it was pretty important to keep the entire object sharp, we would probably want to shoot at a less shallow aperture. Okay, now let's take a look at a shutter adjustment. Here we have the shutter set to 1 60th of a second, and I'm just gonna wave my arm around like an idiot, and Rachel will take the photo to illustrate motion blur. So if we take a look, we can see that the 1 60th of a second shutter speed was not fast enough to freeze motion. So now let's increase the shutter speed to something faster, like 1 1,000th of a second. And since a faster shutter makes the image darker, we'll raise the ISO to compensate. There. Now we've frozen motion with a fast shutter. Okay, let's combine the concepts from the last two examples into a final example with an ISO adjustment. Here, Daniel and I are gonna run across the frame and we wanna freeze motion. We are also at different distances away from the camera, so to keep us both reasonably sharp, we can't have our depth of field too shallow or only one of us will be in focus. So in this scenario, it's necessary for the shutter speed and aperture to remain where they are, and since our frame is underexposed, we'll need to increase the ISO to compensate. Also, since we don't have a third person, I'll lock the focus on Daniel and then switch the lens to manual focus. Now we can use a self-timer and take the shot. Real quick, we wanna tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people with thousands of classes covering photography, video, design, and a whole lot of other things. Fun fact, we just released our own Skillshare class on DIY product photography, so if you enjoy our YouTube videos but wish there were more, well, this class is just that. It's perfect for any of you who are aspiring or practicing photographers stuck at home with a bunch of ideas but no model, special equipment, or set. This class will give you all the tools you need and the confidence to get started right away. In addition to our class, there's so many other great photography and filmmaking classes on Skillshare, like this one by Niles and Caleb from Moment, where they teach iPhone filmmaking. Or if you want to learn more about getting started with photography, there are classes made specifically for beginners to get started shooting, like this class on Understanding Aperture by Jamal Berger.
Most classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons that can fit just about any schedule. And a premium membership is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 people to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership so you can watch our class and have access to thousands more. See you in there. When I started doing photography, I wrote in my notebook um, a few key details that helped me um, whenever I'd go out and shoot. And so we're gonna put those on the screen right now so you can screenshot them and keep them with you when you're shooting until you get the hang of it yourself. So to recap, the subject matter, the lighting, and the overall look you want will determine your manual mode settings. Use ISO to increase or decrease exposure as needed, but be careful of taking your ISO too high so as not to introduce too much noise into your image. Use shutter speed to increase or decrease exposure as needed, but know that too slow of a shutter can result in blurry images. Use aperture to increase or decrease exposure as needed, but just know that you'll be affecting the depth of field with this adjustment. The higher the f-stop number, the larger your depth of field will be, meaning that more of your image will be acceptably sharp. The lower your f-stop number, the more shallow your depth of field will be, resulting in a blurrier background and foreground. So hopefully all that made sense. Shooting in manual mode is all about finding the right balance of settings to get the right exposure with the right look. There is a lot more nuance involved with all the elements we talked about in this video, but the goal here is just to help you feel more comfortable shooting in manual mode. If you force yourself to go out and shoot in manual mode, it will start to become second nature to you and you'll likely feel a whole lot more comfortable with your camera. It's true. If you haven't already, check out our two new channels. Mine is about making money online and Rachel's is all about fitness. She has more subscribers than me. Your words. Come on over, subscribe. Like this video if you like sleeping in. Subscribe if you don't. Comment something nice. See you in the next one.